lessen the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. What used to work, they say, does not anymore. Omicron, albeit milder for most compared to other variants, is spreading too fast to trace. And as Bell Peary reports, it's now up to individuals to self-monitor and act accordingly. We all need to assume that we have been in contact with somebody with the virus. It's a key reason for BC's new approach to COVID-19. Somewhere, somehow, you have been or will be close to someone with Omicron. The plan now? Think about ways to prevent transmission. The number one most important one, of course, is vaccination. Self-management, so making sure we're managing our own symptoms and testing of those who are eligible for treatment and for a testing of people who are living or working in higher risk settings. That's the change that we've been making over this past few weeks. Some of those changes, almost daily at times, have led to much confusion and anger. Earlier this week, the BC Centre for Disease Control amended recommendations for isolation and testing on their website without any broader communication. Officials admit it was a mistake. To be frank, uh, my staff are tired. We've been working on this for a long time, and we are also being affected by the fact that uh, lots of people are off sick right now. With Omicron's extremely short incubation time, Dr. Bonnie Henry says contact tracing is no longer useful. The best advice is to self-monitor for signs of the virus every day, just like you would for a cold or the flu. That may sound innocuous, but the pandemic is far from over. We are clearly not in a place where it's endemic. Case numbers and hospitalizations are still far too high, straining the overall health system. While precautions and vaccines are not likely how we'll live with COVID in the long run, experts say that's what we need to get through this stage of the pandemic. So that is going to help for whatever comes next, because there will be something next. For now, on the COVID front, the forecast is for a gentler summer than the last two. But then the advice is to prepare for what may come in the fall. Bell Puri, CBC News, Vancouver. Let's bring in Justin McElroy now. As Dr. Henry is saying now, Justin, the, the majority of us are being pushed to get more comfortable with a certain amount of exposure, but the risks of severe illness and even death remain the same for some British Columbians. When it comes to risks, what does the data show us? Yeah, and this is what part of the province was saying today, is that if you are fully vaccinated and that you don't have any health conditions in Omicron, there's a very low chance of you going to hospital. And they displayed some data with that. Take a look here. Uh, the green lines are people with zero at-risk conditions, yellow one to two risks, red three risks. And you see, if you zoom in there, it is very low if you have zero at-risk conditions or if you're fully vaccinated or if you're under 70. But you can see it gets bigger and bigger as you go from top left to bottom right here up to 66 percent of unvaccinated people over the age of 70 with three or more at-risk conditions went to hospital in the last wave and so you might ask yourself well doesn't the province's strategy here still put those people at risk and there's an argument to be made for that but the province believes on the whole they can change their guidelines when it comes to what people do if they're exposed the amount of days they have to stay in isolation and so forth because the way that Omicron transmits is both much more and different. Now, the province says it can follow these guidelines because BC is starting to see uh, the peak of Omicron. Do the numbers, does the data bear that out? Yeah, it's been a difficult thing to figure out, right? Because we're not tracking individual cases nearly as much as we did before. And so what we look at instead is hospitalizations and specifically the number of new entries to hospital each day. And you can see in this chart that number rising, rising, rising from the end of December, about 20 a day, all the way up to more than 100, more than 150 yesterday. But you can see it looks like it might starting to be cresting. That's certainly the government's argument and belief right now in its modeling. They believe that we are getting through the worst of it. It will allow them to have these new guidelines. However, like a lot of this pandemic, we do have to wait and see whether this strategy is going to work for British Columbia in the medium and long term. All right, Justin McElroy, thanks very much. Thanks, Dan. Let's take a look at today's daily COVID case numbers. There are 924 COVID positive people in hospital. 130 of those are in intensive care. The rate of hospitalization for unvaccinated people, five times higher compared to the people who are immunized. Nine more people have died from the disease in B.C. More than 2,500 so far have passed away in B.C. And the province has now declared five new health care outbreaks and one over. There are 62 ongoing outbreaks. Classes at Simon Fraser University and the University of Victoria are returning to campus on Monday. 
The universities maintain in-person learning is safe despite current COVID transmission rates. But as the CBC's Michelle Gassoub shows us, some students worry the decision puts them at risk. By Monday, lecture halls at SFU and UVic will be packed with students, a move SFU's provost says is perfectly safe. Omicron transmission is occurring in social settings where people spend prolonged periods of time interacting with one another. It's just not the lecture hall setting where we're seeing it. I have been in lecture halls. I'm just waiting for the 300 people to come and join me. But the Student Society says a survey of over 5,000 students shows a majority are uncomfortable with a return to class with COVID numbers still so high. We don't really know um, how Omicron is going to behave in a university setting. And so the uncertainty is overwhelming for the overwhelming amount of our membership. All of my classes are quite small. I think the biggest, because I'm a fourth year student, has about 20 people in it. So I have at least the small bitter comfort that I'm a little bit more safe than people who are going into lecture halls. But I'm still incredibly uncomfortable. UVic, also returning to in-person classes after the weekend, said in a statement, since structured educational settings do not amplify transmission, a move to online instruction is not an effective means of reducing COVID-19. But some students remain skeptical. If you're in class, you're not allowed to drink water, which isn't, it's not a major thing, but if it's safe enough to cram 200 students into a lecture hall, but not safe enough for one of them to, you know, take a drink of water. Um, I, 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 it, it, it doesn't produce confidence. The universities say they've been studying the transmission of Omicron in academic settings from other schools. Kwantlen and BCIT have been back in person since the new year. But UBC has taken another route, pushing its return to classes to at least early February, a move the SFU Student Society would like to see as well. We're fighting for our safety. Um, it shouldn't be this way. Another heated debate about keeping students safe in a pandemic that keeps persisting. Michelle Gassoub, CBC News, Vancouver. An unplanned week off school is coming to an end for some kids in the BC interior. There were no classes because there weren't enough teachers. Three were sick with COVID-19. And as Brady Strachan reports, safety concerns kept the rest away. Wow. 10-year-old Julio Cohen is learning from home this week. His elementary school in Armstrong, B.C. was closed, uncertain when it would reopen again. The kids did not know when they're going to get to see their teachers again and when they're not, when they're going to get to see their friends again. That's a little bit stressful for sure. The school district says the closure was because of staffing issues. Three staff members have caught COVID, but the teachers union says it's more than that. The local union told CBC News that several teachers refused to teach in class because of the high number of students not wearing masks. In BC, a mask exemption does not require a doctor's note. The union president wants those rules tightened up across the province. We're asking for a revisit of that process and a re-examination of, uh, of uh, exemptions that are given. But the other big issue, of course, is just simply refusal. So we're seeing um, refusals to wear masks, even where an exemption is not being granted. More than 150 parents in Armstrong have signed a petition against masking rules in school. Feels like there's a lot of fear mongering and control going on right now, and we're just tired of it. Nathan Stand even pulled his two sons out of the other elementary school in Armstrong, partially because of mask mandates. I think it's ridiculous. I believe in good hygiene, washing your hands, stay home if you're sick, but I'm tired of it and I think we should all move on. Tonight, the district said Armstrong Elementary will reopen next week and it started reviewing the existing mask exemptions. But even with school back in session, Amy Cohen is worried about divisions in her town. Certainly this issue is um, making me look at my community a little bit differently. Brady Strachan, CBC News, Armstrong, British Columbia. COVID-19 is again throwing challenges in the way of BC high school students. The government has now cancelled January provincial exams for grades 10, 11 and 12. The education ministry says administering the tests has been hugely impacted by what it calls workforce capacity issues linked to COVID. It says it will give an exemption to affected grade 12 students who are graduating early in this year 
Students who are not graduating early will have a chance to do the exams, and that's set for April and June. It is Friday, and for many business owners in BC's entertainment industry, that means another round of lost sales on what could have been a very busy night. The latest extension of health rules has been hard on bars, nightclubs, and plenty of concert venues. As John Hernandez shows us, some owners have managed to keep the doors open by serving food, but that's not a viable option for all. Mo Tarmohamed is supposed to be getting ready to host a concert tonight. Instead, the lights will be off. It's uh, uh, an emotional nightmare uh, compound with uh, you know, the, the financial uh, repercussions of it. The Rickshaw Theatre has cancelled 20 shows as health restrictions on bars, nightclubs and concert venues roll on. And even if measures do get lifted come February 16th, there's still no telling when he might be able to book an act. It's not like we could just uh, you know, flick the switch on and start having shows again because there's a huge lead time between booking a show, promoting a show. It's a similar story for Darlene Rigo, who owns the popular club and music venue, the Fox Cabaret. At a point, you just start to worry that are they ever l going to let us operate the way that we used to, particularly when the gyms got opened up again. Like, yeah. Kind of going, are we that much more of a risk? Technically, these venues could open if they served food. That's what Cabana Lounge owner Dave Kershaw found out when he was reading through the fine print of the latest health order. They didn't reach out to us. It was, us, uh, it was up to us to read the tea leaves, figure it out on our own, and then decide what to do about it. He's been serving food from a taco shop next door and even Domino's Pizza. Last weekend we sold, uh, I think, 30 large pizzas and some tacos. The Roxy is also following suit, announcing it will reopen its doors tonight. But for most venues, satisfying the meal service requirement is just another hurdle amid a long line of challenges. We've considered it. We even considered, what if we could put in a kitchen? But we have been so financially strapped just trying to survive. Um, we haven't had the resources to really take that seriously. A local industry on the brink raising concerns about its long-term health. Young people need to get out and have a sense of you know, being in a community, those connections. For most, it's at least another month of closed doors and hoping for the best. John Hernandez, CBC News, Vancouver. A man arrested nearly two years ago in connection with a fatal shooting in Surrey has now been convicted of manslaughter and robbery with a firearm. Robert Tamalier Novik was found guilty in the shooting death of 21-year-old Pritpal Singh. Singh was found dead on the front lawn of a Surrey home in April 2020. Less than a week later, Tamil Yanovic was arrested. Investigators first thought the shooting was targeted, but later figured out Singh's death was random. Tamil Yanovic's next court appearance is in late January. We certainly saw more than our fair share of extreme weather last year. BC Hydro says our energy bills for 2021 show how events like heat waves and cold snaps hit British Columbians because the province shattered previous electricity demands. By looking at the hours each day when energy use spiked, the utility says 2021 was one for the books. They recorded more record-setting demand over more hours on more days compared to any other year, corresponding with unprecedented summer and winter temperatures. An internal hydro survey found three in four respondents were concerned about the pressure climate change is putting on the electrical grid, but the company is trying to reassure customers. We have a flexible hydroelectric system that's able to increase and decrease power generation uh, really quite easily. And this is another example for our customers to be able to see that our system is in good shape and it's able to meet the necessary demands as we continue to see these uh, extreme weather changes happening in our region. Donaldson says there is a surplus of electricity and BC Hydro has more than it needs and they're encouraging people to use electricity instead of fossil fuels. Let's go over to meteorologist Johanna Wagstaff now with the forecast. Joe, it's the weekend. What mm -hmm. do we get? We get uh, non-severe weather for the most Oof. part. So, so yeah, cute. in fact, Dan, <laughs> this really is following that story. This is one of the longest stretches of high pressure that doesn't involve a heat dome uh, in months. 
So really nice to get some generally quiet weather across the province. Now, that's not to say we don't have weather. We've got some interesting things to time out for the weekend, including the battle between fog, sun, and morning drizzle. Let me start you off with the current temperatures. We'll watch those overnight lows dip in the next few nights. Tonight, I think we'll stay around a four for Metro Vancouver, a five right now at YVR. But as we head into the next couple of days, watch for those overnight lows to drop. Check out this shot from just a couple of hours ago from uh, the top of the sea to sky. That is what we could be looking at in the days ahead. Uh, some gorgeous shots if you're at the alpine level and playing it safe. Of course, we still have that widespread BC avalanche public warning. But the valley sticking around in uh, the fog sticking around in the valley, I should say, definitely part of our story. Uh, satellite, a bit of a glitch there in the past hour with our uh, global satellite, but you can see it almost sort of highlights where all of that cloud is right now. Fog moving back in for the overnight and for tomorrow morning. You might even see some drizzle over on the island, but hoping for some mixing in the afternoon and some sunny breaks with highs back up to seven. So I'll take you through the rest of the weekend and our shots of the sun breaking through in the days ahead. We'll appreciate that. Thanks, Joe. You're welcome. The weather update is brought to you by Sophia Financial Group of Raymond James Limited. Register now for our free cash flow connection series at sophiaevents.ca. Canada Post has now unveiled a new commemorative stamp celebrating Eleanor Collins, known as this country's first lady of jazz. It shows a close-up of Collins as illustrated by David Beliveau, the image based on a photograph by Fritz Lindner, a colleague from her days working here at the CBC. The legendary songstress is still swinging at 102 years of age. Born in Edmonton, she now lives in Surrey. Here's a look back at her trailblazing career when she spoke to us on her 100th birthday. Seems like My life is made of music. I'd rather sing something than say no thank you. <laughs> no complaints. And no regrets. No complaints and no regrets. I still believe in chasing dreams and placing bets. But I have learned that all you give is all you get. So give it all you got. Now that I'm 100, I'm ready to give a lot. <laughs> but now that I am at that age, I no longer want to sing, uh, you know, love lost, love found, it, romantic. Uh, they were nice in their place, but I, they have no place for me now. And so I'm more interested in songs that are inspirational or uh, songs that might heal you. In Edmonton and where I was 16 years old and my mother had said well I think you could uh, sing if you will uh, down the street about a block and a half there was a restaurant who had decided to have live music and so Saturday nights I would uh, allow to go and I was I sang at the supper hour you got to know where you came from <laughs> Good evening, this is the Eleanor Show. They've decided they're gonna give me a show of my own and uh, it was gonna co be called simply Eleanor. So uh, this is our first show and we're, we're all figuring out well, what will we do and they're gonna feature also Chris Gage there on the piano. And um, finally, uh, the lady came to me and I said, well, what, what, I, what are we going to wear? Now it's famous because of course there was all kinds of pictures taken of that particular thing with Chris at the piano. And so that's when they were sing, playing the theme, that's what I was and I was leaning up against the piano. It's very comfortable and at home. I've just had so much and I better be grateful because it could be different. People say, well, it's because uh, you're still here. I said, oh, it, is that different? And they said, oh, yes. Back to the song, no complaints, no regrets. I definitely have no regrets.
No complaints, no regrets. 102. Well done, Eleanor Collins. That was amazing. So, still with music, larger-than-life rock icon Meatloaf has died. The big-voiced theatrical singer sold more than 100 million albums and appeared in dozens of movies. Meatloaf is an actor who acts like he can sing. Meatloaf scored mega hits in 1977 with Bad Out of Hell and the single Paradise by the Dashboard Light and Two Out of Three Ain't Bad. He won a Grammy for his 1993 hit, I Do Anything for Love. He made 12 albums over a career that spanned six decades. He had a successful but lesser known acting career, appearing in more than 50 TV shows and films, including Rocky Horror Picture Show. His cause of death has not yet been released. Meatloaf was 74. The province still reeling from a horrific discovery. Why the four people found frozen in Manitoba just steps from the U.S. border may have ties to a human smuggling ring. That story's next. Hello to everyone watching us on our commercial-free live stream. Glad you're here. Canada is partnering on an unusual mission that helps weather forecast measure and ch measure climate change in the Atlantic. As Paul Withers explains, it's cheaper, it's greener, and it solves a problem caused by the pandemic. It is one of the largest deployments in the Atlantic of Argo floats. 100 of the robotic sensors are being released by the French sailing yacht Iris. That's because large research vessels are scarcer these days. As with most things during COVID, Paul, uh, a lot of our uh, at-sea operations were interrupted. Blair Greenan is Canadian lead in the Argo program, a network of 3,800 floating sensors around the world delivering real-time ocean data. Every year, 1,000 floats need to be released to sustain the system. Using a sailing vessel to do that was a very cost-effective way of getting these in the water. And, uh, and again, a, a low carbon footprint with that. Iris is in the midst of an epic three-month mission that will fill gaps in the Argo network in the South Atlantic. This week, it completed the second leg of the journey when ship and crew safely arrived at St. Helena Island. It was carrying a dozen Argo floats sent from the Bedford Institute of Oceanography in Nova Scotia and loaded on board in Massachusetts last month. Argo has actually truly revolutionized our ability to study the ocean um, and understand how it controls climate and weather. The floats gradually descend two kilometers and return to the top taking temperature and salinity measurements along the way. Every 10 days it breaks the surface to upload data to a satellite. The information is used by weather forecasters and scientists measuring ocean conditions in real time. A lot of the heat that uh, is going into the atmosphere from uh, greenhouse gas emissions ends up in the ocean, and this is another way of monitoring how the Earth system is heating with climate change. The IRIS deployment is an international partnership between Canada, the U.S., the European Union, and Blue Observer, a private oceanographic company that owns the yacht. The trip celebrated as a worthy contribution. I, I was impressed at the departure, and I will be impressed when they come back in February. Uh, mission accomplished. An innovative, no pollution solution to a pandemic challenge. Paul Withers, CBC News, Halifax. tonight about an alleged human smuggling operation that authorities say led to the deaths of four people, including a baby in southern Manitoba. Police say they were part of a larger organized group that set out on foot to cross into the U.S. 
As Cameron McIntosh explains, the details may point to a sophisticated plan. This is where a man, woman, teen, and infant presumed to be a family froze to death. It's how they got here and who helped. That's now part of a cross-border human smuggling investigation. We certainly are seeing it here in the northern border, and this is an example, and, an, and certainly an unfortunate one at that. Wednesday morning, American authorities arrested 47-year-old Steve Shand of Florida in a van just over the border from where the bodies were found. Two Indian nationals were with him, five more were approaching, most of them dressed similarly in new winter gear, including matching boots. One told authorities he bought an illegal student visa to get into Canada to sneak into the U.S. So this is an orchestrated crossing. This is an orchestrated entry to Canada. This immigration lawyer says getting a visa points to a sophisticated operation. It really troubles me that there are people who are profiting off of schemes like this. C'était tellement, tellement tragique. Today, the Prime Minister called the deaths tragic. The Indian High Commission tweeted it will help the investigation. At least some of those Indian nationals came from the Gujarat region. There's a history of Gujarati Indians trying to cross the southern U.S. border. They want to go to U.S. and settle down there because they believe that that's the only country that has a lot of opportunities. American officials say boots worn by those who crossed match tracks from other suspected crossings here. This American immigration lawyer says he knows people who have tried. People who do crazy things for, for hope, what drives them is hope. The reality is people from other countries want to live the American dream. The seven people who made it over the border are in custody in the U.S. The RCMP say they're working to identify the four people who died on this side of the border. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Winnipeg. To a developing story now in Mexico, authorities say two Canadians have been killed and another injured in a shooting. It happened at a hotel in the tourist hotspot of Playa del Carmen along the Caribbean coast. Karen Pauls takes us through the details and the dramatic scenes that unfolded at Hotel Shkarat. This unverified video shows what appears to be the victims of the shooting. They were guests of the Hotel Eshkaret. Authorities say three Canadians were taken to hospital, two have died. Quintana Roo State Security Chief Lucio Hernandez says the shooting happened after an argument between the guests. He shared these photos on Twitter. In a series of tweets, he said this is the hotel guest responsible for the shooting and asked the public for help in finding him. A lot of these hotels there, uh, or the, the, the nicer hotels are somewhat secluded um, and there's a but at the same time it's it's quite uh, a busy area quite populated in a series of tweets Mexican authorities say that some of those involved are known to Canadian police in this statement the hotel says it deeply regrets what happened this afternoon our thoughts and prayers are with the victims and their families it also says this was an isolated event and they are cooperating with authorities Global Affairs Canada says it's aware of reports that Canadian citizens have been affected by an incident in Mexico. Consular officials are in contact with local authorities and are available to provide consular help, but they can't share any further information because of privacy concerns. This is just the latest act of violence along Mexican's Mayan Riviera at a time when tourism is booming because Mexico doesn't have many COVID restrictions. Karen Paul's reporting. On the brink of war, as Russia build up, builds up its strength on the border with Ukraine, the latest from Europe and the worry for loved ones from here in BC. That story's next. You've probably heard it before, maybe even danced to it. It's Bhangra, a catchy form of Indian folk music and dance that's catching on. And here's one reason why, a two-day Bhangra festival in Vancouver. Things are wrapping up tonight with a competition, 10 teams from across North America facing off for the top prize. This festival is popular with people of all backgrounds. It's one sign Bhangra is breaking through in a big way. Here's the CBC's Deborah Goble. There's a saying in, uh, in Punjabi about dancing, about how it's not about how you dance on stage, it's about making you know, the hearts of those people watching you, making their hearts dance. 
Primal and rhythmic, Bhangra dancing is a traditional Indian art form that goes back more than six centuries. Like it's, it, it's kind of catchy. Catchy and all about the beat. From 14th century farmers to modern day festivals, Bhangra has always been an integral part of Indian culture. I think Bhangra has always been considered a very ethnic folk thing, even amongst the Punjabi community. Everybody just kind of figured, oh, well, you know, they know, they know what Bhangra is and just kind of accept it, almost take it for granted. But while it may be very familiar to the more than 100,000 Indo-Canadians living in Vancouver's Lower Mainland, it hasn't really reached the mainstream yet. That, however, is slowly changing. We have a lot in store for the city of Vancouver. As our slogan states, Vancouver, city of Bhangra. It's basically, I think, a lot to do with the marketing. Um, what happens having so many Punjabi events in a place like Vancouver, as many of the festivals and the culture shows, etc., are marketed sort of by Punjabis for Punjabis, because uh, it's kind of, kind of considered to be their ethnic thing to do. Uh, in repackaging this, we basically decided to take you know a very mainstream format to it and not treat it as like this marginal Punjabi ethnic thing, but just treat it as a performing art uh, that basically anybody can enjoy. So throw your hands up in the air and dance to the music. Anyone can do it. That is the beauty of Bhangra. Deborah Goebel, CBC News, Vancouver. Here are some of the stories we're following tonight for you on CBC Vancouver News. The number one most important one, of course, is vaccination. Self-management, so making sure we're managing our own symptoms and testing of those who are eligible for treatment and for a testing of people who are living or working in higher risk settings. That's the change that we've been making over this past few weeks. BC Health officials want you to now think about ways to stop transmission of Omicron. They're shifting their strategies, saying the variant is spreading too fast to trace. Now it's up to individuals to self-monitor and stay home if you need to. I'm still incredibly uncomfortable and incredibly stressed out by this reality. Some students at two of BC's biggest universities are not keen to return to in-class learning. Simon Fraser University and the University of Victoria are returning to campus on Monday. The universities claim it is safe despite current COVID transmission rates, but some students argue it's putting them at risk and want officials to reconsider. And Canada's first lady of jazz is now on a stamp. Canada Post is commemorating Eleanor Collins. The image is from a photo from her days working here at the CBC. Collins is now 102 and still going strong. Overseas top diplomats from Washington and Moscow met in Geneva today as tensions ratchet up in Eastern Europe. Will those talks finished without a breakthrough or clear leverage for either side? As Magda Gavrasalasa tells us, the, with Ukraine's future on the line, the U.S. is once again urging Russia to avoid the path leading towards conflict. We stand firmly uh, with Ukraine. That's U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken after a 90-minute long meeting with Russia's foreign minister in Geneva today, a meeting aimed at addressing fears of an invasion. Blinken said that Russia has a choice to make. It can choose the path of diplomacy that can lead to peace and security or the path that will lead only to conflict, severe consequences, and international condemnation. The U.S. has provided Ukraine with $650 million in defense materials over the last year. 
This as Russia continued to beef up its military presence near Ukraine's borders. Now there's some 100,000 troops on the ground. And anti-aircraft missile systems have been deployed to Belarus that Moscow says is for military drills. But today, Foreign Minister Lavrov continued to deny that there's a plan to invade. Is an invasion likely, as President Biden suggested? Unless the United States doesn't go to heaven again, I don't think so. While the U.S. wants Russia to pull back its troops, Moscow has its own demands. That includes a promise that Ukraine will never join the NATO alliance, and it wants to put a halt to NATO expansion further east. Lavrov says he spoke openly with Blinken today. He hopes emotions will cool down, but that there are no guarantees. Despite no breakthrough during the Geneva talks today, the White House said there are several steps that can be taken. To increase transparency, to reduce risk, to advance arms control, to build trust. We're coordinating uh, with our allies and partners. The White House says President Biden will meet with his national security advisors this weekend. The U.S. is set to provide a written response to Russia's proposals next week. And both sides say the hope is to keep talking. Mark de Gebrasselas, CBC News, Washington. For more, we're now joined by Natalie Jatskovich. She is with the Ukrainian-Canadian Congress, the B.C. Provincial Council. Natalie, first of all, you, you have loved ones in Ukraine. Can you tell us where they are relative to the Russian border and, and what they're telling you about the situation there? Uh, I have my family back in Ukraine. They live in Kharkiv. It's my mother and father, elderly, elderly people. Uh, they live, uh, the city, industrial city of Kharkiv is located literally 40 kilometers away from the Russian border. Uh, and it's uh, one hour by contemporary Russian tank to the city downtown. That's got to be concerning for you. What, what are they saying about the situation there? It is very concerning and very stressful for me. It's concerning and stressful for them as well. Um, what they are saying that uh, the situation is quite um, quite serious there. Uh, people in the city are getting ready for invasion. There is no panic in the city at this point. Uh, but the uh, city is informing its citizens, its residents, where the nearest uh, bomb shelters are, just in case, how to stay safe in case of a uh, rapid military attack. Uh, some people start to make, uh, to, to collect some supplies, to save some supplies, like food, uh, like medication, like other life necessities in case of a rapid attack, because nobody knows when it's it's gonna happen, right? It might happen tomorrow. It might it might happen in one week. It might happen in a couple of days. Nobody knows. So everybody's pretty tensed and stressed out there. And and have you talked to your parents in, in terms of what they're going to do? You mentioned they were elderly. Are, are they able to to go to a bomb shelter, or, or what are they going to do? That's a good question. That's a very good question because my mother has mobility issues. And it will be very difficult to relocate her to the bomb shelter in case it's needed to be done quickly. Yeah, so they are, they are very worried how it's going to unfold. Now, the federal government here in Canada has pledged uh, support. It's offered Ukraine a $120 million loan to help uh, face down what our prime minister calls an aggressive attempt by Russia to destabilize it. What do you make of the support that Canada has offered to Ukraine so far? Uh, you know, our community in Canada and in British Columbia in particular, we are very thankful of, thankful for all the support that we get throughout this uh, eight years of war. We also ask our government to think about and support us in uh, um, giving Ukraine and NATO membership action plan and uh, providing Ukraine with defensive weapon if it is possible and uh, the sooner better than later right mm. uh, we also uh, uh, would support if Canadian government increased uh, sanctions pressure on Russia that would be great and uh, if we could work on canceling uh, Nord Stream 2 pipeline in Europe that would help with sanctions as well. Natalie Jatskovich, we appreciate your time. Uh, best to you and your family in Ukraine. Thank you very much. 
just before 6.40, a live look at Georgia Street. Somewhat bustling out there. Johanna has a look at the forecast coming for the weekend. And for once, you can park the umbrella. No need for it in your planning. And that is Mr. Bentley. He's a bulldog with a talent. He can dance. We'll show you which one and why Sir William the Cat, uh, not so impressed. They're next. So orcas, of course, are aquatic, as we know. But their ancestors were terrestrial. They lived on land. How did orcas evolve to survive in the ocean? Seems hard to imagine, doesn't it, that an animal that looks like this is actually related to even-toed ungulates, like uh, deer, uh, cattle, and even a hippopotamus. It's the closest modern relative to, to whales. But there's been a whole range of major anatomical adaptations for living in the ocean. Yeah, and you'd think, I mean, in terms of breathing alone, what are some of the adaptations that these orca had to go through? Well, a, a big one was the evolution of the, the nostrils, which are normally on the front of the nose, in the front of the skull. They moved all the way back here, and this is actually the paired nostrils of oh. the whale on top of the skull. And of course, if you imagine that the head is here with, with tissue on it, this would be where the blowhole is up here. And so this is to enable them to go, swim quickly through the water, come up to breathe without lifting their head, which would be incredibly inefficient. So this is one of the many adaptations that allows them to be very streamlined in the water. So their nostrils traveled up their head and then up on top. They migrated over millions of years and, and that's the way they are now. Right. And then again, if we think about the hippopotamus that has feet like this, where would those feet go on an orca? Well, the front limbs, just like ours, uh, the same bones are in the four flippers of, of whales, including this orca, but the hind legs are gone. They've just uh, disappeared. There's a couple of pelvic bones, little tiny things that aren't attached to anything that still remain. The only vestige of, of the, the lower legs and, and that apparatus in the terrestrial mammal. And you can't help but notice these large, sharp, conical teeth that the orca has. The killer whale is the top predator in the ocean, and it can eat pretty much whatever it wants. They don't chew their food, they grasp it and tear it with these very, very sharp teeth. And with this set of uh, dental uh, weaponry, they can take pretty much anything they want in the ocean, either anything from the blue whale, the largest animal on the planet, down to very small schooling fish. A dog from Vancouver had a bone to pick with late night host Jimmy Fallon and his dancing recently. Mr. Bentley is a 10 year old British bulldog who was featured in the Tonight Show segment, Why Is Your Pet Better Than Me? And he gave Fallon a run for his money when he showed off his smooth moonwalking. And Min Mr. Bentley, the boogieing bulldog, joins us today with his pet, parent, Brad Friesen, and another member of the family, Sir William Wallace. Brad, everyone, thanks for joining us. First of all, Brad, does Bentley, Mr. Bentley, have, have it in him for one more quick performance? I think so, yeah. He's got a stick over uh, waiting for him in the kitchen that he really wants to go get. So, Bentley, yeah. are you ready? Do you want to go get that stick? Go get it. Go get it. What's this? Come here. Get it. Can you get the stick? Maybe not. <laughs> What's this? Come here. Do you want it? Oh, yeah. Okay. Get it. Go. Go. Uh, 
<laughs> no, he's not going to do it. A good attempt. It's hard to perform on camera on command. I get it. It, it, it really, it really is. is. It really is. <laughs> okay, Brad, how, how did he learn to move like that? So um, he kind of just started doing it as a puppy and he does it two different ways. He does it when he's nervous or something's new in a space or he does it when he's excited and he has something in his mouth. Then he, uh, he goes backwards for some reason. <laughs> and how did Mr. Bentley become part of your home? Um, so I actually stole him from my girlfriend, Alicia, <laughs> and I bought her Wally because um, me and Bentley kind of hit it off and uh, she lost the love of her dog. So as, as, as Wally filled in on a, on, a, on a nice basis, provided some, some uh, 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 domestic bliss? Let's be honest, he's my cat also. <laughs> <laughs> now, Mr. Bentley found himself a, a new large following on TikTok and on the social media. How have people been reacting to what he can do? It, it's been really fun kind of walking around Vancouver since the, the late show. Uh, people uh, recognize him and, and uh, know that he was on the show. But just his kind of general demeanor of um, being a dog that's scared of lots of things, but he's super adventurous. Um, this is a, a magazine that recently came out with him on the front cover, <laughs> flying in the helicopter. Um, and uh, so he gets lots of notoriety and lots of uh, attention for, for his not only being scared and doing weird things, but also being so adventurous and loving doing fun things. And what kind of reaction have you had after uh, he and you and, and, <laughs> and Wally appeared on The Tonight Show? Oh yeah, that's been, that's been really fun. Again, um, even just going into lo the local coffee shop and having everybody have, having seen it and know about it, it's, uh, it's, it's definitely brought a lot of uh, joy to a lot of people. What does Wally make of all this? <laughs> well, he is just unimpressed about everything. <laughs> oh, dear. That's his thing. Yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's a resting cat face, we understand. For that reason, cat face. Mr. Yeah. Bentley and Wally, wherever you are, thanks for being with us today and showing off a little bit. Thank you. <laughs> resting cat face also. <laughs> That's a new one. I'm going to have to trademark that one. Go ahead, tweet it out. It's lovely. Yeah, that, copyright, that, Dan. <laughs> so before we found out that, you know, it's a British, it's an English bulldog, and it's mm -hmm. a Scottish cat. So they are, ah. they tolerate each other. <clears throat> tolerate yeah, each other. I was just going to say, yeah. <laughs> That's yeah, not they, bad. They, uh, they, they uh, exist together. Yeah, I have to yeah. say, though, Dan, I asked I'm if they have the Welsh star bird star. or something, and I, you know, you just don't want to get into that. Yeah. Or a goldfish or something like that. But I'm totally Star Trek. I watched mm -hmm. Mr. Bentley with my son uh, in his helicopter doing the helicopter valley yeah. flies all the time. <laughs> so I just flew to him. I was like, that's Mr. Bentley. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, very this same. is very exciting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and now I have a new goal in life to get my dog Rodney on the cover of Drool. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Keep reaching for that rainbow, yeah. Rodney. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. We should probably get the all weather right, now right. at one point, yeah, I, was I guess. Just gonna yeah. say, let mm -hmm. me get you to the forecast now that I've got a new life goal. Uh, let's get through the uh, current temperatures because it is still very cold across Atlantic Canada. And we're actually seeing a fresh surge of cold air. Not that you want to hear that uh, dipping down across the prairies and uh, uh, really into Saskatchewan, Manitoba. And that's going to resurge in Ontario uh, and Quebec next week. Different way to look at that. We've got this big high pressure ridge. Keep your eye on the yellows and oranges. That's the ridge of high pressure that's going to keep conditions relatively dry through to the weekend. It dips slightly on Tuesday, so we've got a slight chance of some drizzle, and then it builds right back in through next week. So this is a long-lasting high-pressure ridge, just some drizzle and a uh, possibility of freezing frog in through Prince George in the morning. Everywhere else, it's valley fog or morning fog that we do have the risk of lingering a little longer. Now, Haida Gwaii, you are going to get into some showers uh, tomorrow afternoon, but everyone else dry and just watching the fog. A few more clouds Sunday into Monday, again, as that ridge breaks down slightly. Uh, but this is our long range forecast. And just like we saw today, that low stratus hung around a little longer. We didn't see too many sunny breaks in Vancouver. Beautiful day over towards Victoria. So it's really going to have to be a day by day story, depending on uh, how soon we can get that sun to break through. But all mm -hmm. in all, Dan, that's not a bad point. It's, it's pretty good. We'll take it. So will William and <laughs> Mr. Bentley. <laughs> right. Thanks, Joe. You're welcome. Still with pets now, and it's safe to say they play a big part in many families that we've seen.
But animal welfare advocates say family law has not kept up. When there's a divorce or separation, the law gives top priority to what's best for the children. But as Sarah Levitt explains, now there are calls for pets to get similar consideration. The message from the Montreal SPCA, relationships die, but pets live on. And it's calling for a change on how they're treated in a breakup. Currently, uh, in Quebec, animals are treated like property in family law. The same is true across Canada. It's the person who purchased the animal or signed the animal's adoptions papers that will be entitled to keep the animal. The SPCA wants the welfare of the pet to be considered, similar to how custody for a child is determined, something that makes sense to many owners at this dog park. A pet is like a... It's a lot more than a car. I mean, you know, it's part of the family. With children, there is a law to protect them. With dogs, anything can happen. We certainly have not planned for it. Um, not that we're, we're planning to change anything about our, our marital status. <laughs> this SPCA lawyer says a recent ruling in Spain sets an example. It's the latest European country to recognize pets as sentient beings, not property. Panda eh, is de los dos. Lawyer Lola Garcia fought for her client's right to have some ownership of her dog after her ex refused to share following a breakup. El vínculo especial de las partes. She says emotional bonds should be considered. In the ruling, the judge granted joint custody of Panda, noting the dog's welfare played a role in his decision. At home, the SPCA's campaign comes as the province is in the midst of its first family law reform since the 1980s. We have the perfect opportunity in order to fix this problem in the Civil Code of Quebec. Until then, the SPCA says owners should be taking matters into their own hands. It offers its own animal custody agreement, a pet prenup, if you will. Statistically, you could stay with your cat longer than with your spouse, the SPCA says. So think ahead. Sarah Levitt, CBC News, Montreal. Here's something to make you smile, feel a bit nostalgic. Time to dance your cares away again. Fraggle Rock is back. The Canadian Connections coming up. I have a very special necklace. It's actually called a thali. My husband is from India, from South India. And it was given to me on my wedding day, which will be 20 years ago in July. And my mother-in-law picked it out with me when we were in India 21 years ago. And so it was presented on my wedding day and I wear it kind of every day, just like you wear a wedding band um, traditionally here. So it's a very special piece of jewelry, not just kind of, yeah, not a regular piece of jewelry, I guess. My mother-in-law passed away this February, and then I was with my father in palliative care, um, just helping him out until June when he passed away. And then shortly after my father passed away, actually like two days after the funeral, I looked down and all of a sudden I couldn't see the necklace. And my husband and I thought, oh, it'll turn up somewhere, but I usually don't take it off. And we tried to kind of retrace where I might have taken it off. My husband started putting up posters everywhere, posted on Facebook, lost and found, contacted the police, contacted everyone he could think of, pawn shops, everything. And the community response at that time was pretty incredible. Um, there was a gentleman that volunteered his services with a metal detector and came to our home and voluntarily searched my flower beds in case it had broken and fallen off and searched the playgrounds that the kids play at. And we kind of gradually accepted the fact that we're not gonna get this back. Kept posting, my husband kept posting on Facebook, Lost and Found, just in case, because we thought if it's in someone's hands somewhere, maybe they'll see the post. Six months later on Christmas, I opened up my last Christmas gift and I was in utter shock when I saw my Bali in this box. And I was like, what? Like, I just, I, I was speechless. I can't believe he kept it a secret, but at the end of November on Facebook, Lost and Found, a woman contacted him saying, I think I might have the necklace that you're looking for. And without me knowing, he went and saw her. And indeed it was the necklace. A few weeks before Christmas came, um, he said, you know, I want to make a Christmas hamper for someone. So if you can start getting ready, like some food and some toys, it's a single mom with kids these age. And so I started like 
gathering all this food and toys and like, let's deliver it on Christmas. And I'm like, it's a friend of a friend who needs some help. I'm like, okay, let's do that. And so after I opened the gift on Christmas, he's like, and guess who you're going to give this to? You're going to give this Christmas hamper to Marissa who returned your necklace. And I was like, okay, let's go do it. And I just, I think I was in shock. Like, honestly, I went, we met Marissa. It was a cold day. We stayed outside and we like hugged and she just explained, you know, a little bit of her story. She's a single mom trying to go back to school and she's gone through some hard times, but found the necklace and then found the Facebook lost and found post and decided to return it. Yeah. Getting this back at the beginning of the new year, it was like, so, so refreshing and just, yeah, hope giving. Hi, I'm Amy Bell, and here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. Enjoy CBC Radio 1 while you're on the go with the free CBC Listen app. Get live access to your favorite CBC Radio programs, like the early edition with Stephen Quinn. Missed your morning show? You can also listen to Radio 1 programs on demand and browse CBC Music playlists, podcasts, and more. It's love at first listen. Download the free CBC Listen app today. Dust off your dancing shoes after more than three decades, Fraggle Rock is getting a reboot. The beloved children's program has returned. A new generation are going to meet Red, Gobo, Moki, and of course Boober. And just like the original, this version has a strong Canadian connection. Eli Glasner explains. Get your cares away. If you're of a certain generation, Let the music play. you know the show and the song. I feel it deep within my soul. You would make sure that you, you know, crossed everything off your child schedule and you were there to see Fraggle Rock because it just was such a fun, high energy, exciting show. He's being very quiet right now. In 1983, Muppet guru Jim Henson brought viewers to a whole new world with a series shot in Toronto. I got a Fraggle! Original Fraggle cast member David Goals remembers arriving. I just thought, oh my God, here we go. I'm going into the I'm going into the winter. But had warm memories of the crew. Totally dedicated. They were completely on board with what we were doing. Okay, okay. Now there's a new Fraggle series, this time shot inside the Calgary Film Center. <laughs> Puppeteer Kira Hall says the scale was like nothing she's ever seen. You can see it in the show, multi-level sets where you're going up and puppeteering on a second level, live water features. We even tried asking one of the Fraggles how it feels to be back, but he couldn't quite grasp the concept. Oh, I don't know about puppets. I'm sorry, I don't know anything about that. It's a whole hobby I've never gotten into. What in blazes is that? And the Fraggles aren't the only Made in Canada critters making a return. That is until Burt Raccoon wakes up. Kevin Gillis dreamt up the family of raccoons who hit the airwaves in 1985. When we first aired on the CBC, we were doing 2 million people a week. Uh, it was as big as Hockey Night in Canada. Story. Now the kids who grew up on the show are clamoring for more. Thankfully, we have wonderful fans all over the all over the world who aren't ashamed to write things in and you know do drawings and do write songs. Gillis is working on re-releasing the raccoons with remastered music and art and the possibility of new shorts in the future. It seems a mix of Canadian storytelling and nostalgia hits the sweet spot for parents. It's much easier when it's been vetted by your own childhood experience. You know, I know that the Fraggles have a great message and impart uh, a kind of wonderful feeling. I know that the Raccoons is low-key a show about climate change. <laughs> Soon kids will get a taste of what their parents devoured decades ago. Eli Glasner, CBC News, Toronto. Yeah, I'll be watching. Thanks for joining us tonight on CBC Vancouver News at 6. You can watch this newscast on CBC GM, our free app. We're also on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube, and on our website, cbc.ca slash bc. Your next local news is at 11 o'clock, right after the National, this night with Zara Premji. And good night. Enjoy your weekend. Stay safe. <laughs>